Militant democracy unmoored, the limits of constitutional analogy in international law, Ming Sung Kuo, European Journal of International Law, Volume 35, Issue 2, May, 2024, published, the 22nd of May, 2024, Abstract, as constitutional democracies are faced with authoritarianism and other anti-constitutionalist threats. International law is seeing its own challenge from the increasing influence of authoritarian states, yet, departing from the recent tendency to model the international legal order after constitutional governance, international lawyers seem to show little interest in the concept of militant democracy, while the latter lies at the center of current debates surrounding constitutional self-defense. This article aims to bring to light the current limits of constitutional analogy in international law, through an investigation into the discrepancy between constitutional and international lawyers in responding to authoritarian coartation, a three-pronged argument is submitted. First, in contrast to other appeals for constitutional self-defense, the concept of militant democracy is contentious where it stands in tension with the constitutional ethos. Second, while militant democracy as a constitutional concept presupposes a democratic and normative version of constitutional ordering, the absence of militant democracy on the international plane betrays the non-democratic, albeit representative, character of the international legal order. Third, attempts to internationalize the concept of militant democracy should be rejected as an international version of militant democracy, would only portend an unholy alliance of militant democracies and exacerbate the political division in international society. It is suggested that, from out of a realignment of international law with the constitutional project of progress, a new constitutional analogy may emerge, giving fresh impetus to the realization of international law's universal liberating promise. Issues section, articles, 1 Introduction, International Militant Democracy Wanted, Authoritarianism and Exclusionary, Populism 1 have long been circulating on the marketplace of political ideas, Two as constant competitors fees of illiberalism in the political process. Authoritarian ideologies and populist forces have not been banished from constitutional democracies. Yet, with such anti-liberal or anti-constitutionalist forces, three moving from the margin to the center of the political arena, a disequilibrium in the place of the established order is seen to be driving constitutional democracies into an existential struggle. All of a sudden, the notion of constitutional self-defense has emerged as one of the most visited subjects in recent constitutional literature. For thus researches the Weimar idea of militant democracy as part of the strategy of constitutional self-defense. For the sake of self-preservation, constitutional democracy should not tolerate authoritarianism, populist or not five and other anti-constitutionalist forces, six past and present constitutional practices from Africa to America to Asia are rediscovered and represented as instantiations of the idea of militant democracy. 7. Having migrated without drawing much attention for years, militant democracy now appears everywhere in global constitutional landscapes. The authoritarian wave has not left the international order undisturbed. 8. As China continues to rise, and seems to be redrawing the geopolitical map with its sharp power, the clouds of a new Cold War between the authoritarian and liberal forces, headed by China and the USA, respectively, are gathering, neither the golden era of international rule of law that arose from the rubbles of the Berlin Wall, and has since revived interest in international or global, constitutionalism is now drawing to an end. 10. With the emergence of what Tom Ginsberg calls authoritarian international law amid the rise of China's influence, 11. The gap between international law's universal liberating promise 12 in its sovereignist stroke status doctrinal basics, which was blurred by the glare of the golden era 13 is brought to the surface again. The assumed teleological progressive outlook in international legal reasoning that casts international law in the ideal image of the rule of law seems to be called into question. 14 is in the domestic constitutional landscape, whether international law is able to resist coartation by authoritarian forces has not escaped the attention of some of the most astute legal minds, 15 yet. In contrast to their predecessors who looked to the development of domestic legal orders as the model for the reform of international law, 
16 current international lawyers seem less eager to learn from prescriptions as to how constitutional orders can defend themselves against subversive forces. 17 ideas of constitutional self-defense such as militant democracy are conspicuously absent, when a new nomus of the earth, 18 driven by authoritarian forces, seems to be redefining the international legal order. This article takes up this apparent discrepancy between constitutional and international law in their responses to authoritarian cooptation, with an eye to making sense of the limits of constitutional analogy in international law, with the current limits of constitutional analogy in the international legal order brought to light. This article advances a three-pronged argument. First, it makes an analytical point of the relationship between constitutional self-defense and militant democracy, while needs for self-defense, or self-preservation, inhere in every constitutional order, 19 not all appeals for constitutional self-defense risk losing the ethos of their attendant constitutional orders in the same way as the call for militant democracy does. 20 failing to see what is put to the test amid this new wave of migration of constitutional ideas, 21. We can hardly appreciate why and how the continuing spread of militant democracy has made constitutional scholars sweat in the face of calls for constitutional self-defense. Second, it argues that the idea of militant democracy as a constitutional concept presupposes a democratic and normative version of constitutional ordering. Thus, the absence of the concept of militant democracy seems to speak to international law's openness towards competing ideologies, betraying the non-democratic, albeit representative, and deeply pluralist character of the international legal order, by bringing to the fore the international legal order's ingrained pluralism and its normative underpinnings and implications, we can see why not only the concept of militant democracy, but also the very idea of constitutional self-defense has difficulty finding its place in international law. Third, it warns against the inadvertent projection of the concept of militant democracy onto the international plane, as a countermeasure to the authoritarian co-optation of international law, given the international legal order's non-democratic but pluralist character, an international version of militant democracy would not bring about democratic international law or global constitutionalism. Rather, projecting the concept of militant democracy onto the international plane portends a present-day, unholy alliance of militant democracies that would only exacerbate the political division in international society. It is suggested that, to contend with authoritarian international law, its root causes should not be left unaddressed. By identifying the source of the frustration with the state of international law, we can then do justice to the constitutional potential of the ideal of international law. Through this realignment of international law with the constitutional project of Progress 22 instead of militant democracy, as a choice of constitutional self, Defense, the constitutional analogy in international law can transcend its current limits and serve international law's cosmopolitan ideal in a rooted way. 23. I should make clear where the critique of international militant democracy to be developed in the following pages is situated before proceeding. As noted above, the concept of militant democracy remains absent from international law. Yet lessons from comparative constitutional law have shown that militant democracy has no difficulty finding its place in jurisdictions where this concept was considered all too alien until recently. 24 Moreover, practices of rediscovering and reframing past and present constitutional practices in terms of militant democracy are not a monopoly of the friends of constitutionalism. Abusers of constitutionalism have also quickly embraced this militant idea 25 in this light, the worry is that, when calls for democratic rallying continue to arise in the face of a seemingly contrary trend in the international order, 26 democracies have invested interests in justifying and framing their action in conceptual terms, as they are becoming militant. 27, and militant democracy is a handy candidate for democracies on this conceptual front, in the changing international order, 28 thus, Despite the virtual absence of militant democracy from international law, I take up the want of internationalization of militant democracy and its implications ahead of time amid increasing calls for democratic defense on the international plane. 29. The argument proceeds as follows. Section 2 first investigates the relationship between constitutional self-defense and militant democracy. 
suggesting that militant democracy, as seen in the discourse on constitutional self-defense strategies, presupposes a normative democratic version of constitutional ordering liberal democracy. Section 3 then takes on the absence of the concept of militant democracy, when international law is seemingly under the pressure of authoritarian cooptation, and brings to light the non-democratic character of the international legal order. Section 4 provides a critique of the implications of the implicit internationalization of militant democracy, as a response to the continuing expansion of authoritarian forces. It further discusses options for liberal democracies, facing authoritarian pressure under a de facto China-USA duarchy as Schmitz and Nomas resting on the balance of power between China and the USA, as two co-ruling hegemons. 30 section 5 concludes with reflections on the relationship between constitutionalism and international law, two constitutional self-defense and militant democracy realigned. Every legal system has its own identity. Without identity, the system cannot hold. 31 Instead, we will only see a hodgepodge of statutory enactments, administrative rules, judicial judgments and other juridical precepts in the legal space concerned. Where the concept of identity is banished in conceiving of the interrelationships among those motley legal precepts, we cannot even speak of it as a legal order properly. 32 This formal concept of identity and jurisprudence frames constitutional thinking too. 33 Seen in this light, constitutional ordering works under the assumption that each constitutional order has its own identity. 34 The migration of the doctrine of unconstitutional constitutional amendment the world over testifies to the jurisprudential influence of the formal concept of identity. 35 Yet the notion of identity in constitutional thinking is more than a conceptual apparatus that enables systematic thinking in conceiving of constitutional ordering, as manifested in inter alia, the eternity clause in master text constitutions. 36 The basic structure doctrine 37 and the substitution test 38 in the comparative jurisprudence of unconstitutional constitutional amendment. Constitutional identity is substantive, departing from the formal concept of identity, as the linchpin of a legal system espoused by legal philosophers. A constitutional order assumes an identity, which is to be identified in the substance of the constitution 39, and mutates into another when its identity alters. 40 Thus, a constitutional order must be able to protect its identity in the face of revolutionary constitutional changes. 41. The doctrine of unconstitutional constitutional amendment is a means to defend the constitution against threats to its identity, a measure of constitutional self-defense. 42. Seen in this light, the notion of constitutional self-defense is not exclusive to constitutional democracies. Every constitutional order has its own identity, and, thus, all constitutional orders have the inherent right to self-defense, if you will, so that their identity can be preserved. Needless to say, a constitution understood as that which sustains the functioning of a political society is not a suicide pact. Point four three. Consider the remaining socialist constitutional orders. 44. The leadership of a Marxist. Leninist Party as the designated vanguard movement party in the perceived historic struggle for socialism constitutes the core of these constitutions. 45. To allow for competitive party politics by constitutional amendment would be nothing but a counter-revolution. 46. The ban on independent parties in these states is just part of their measures for constitutional self-preservation. 47. The party ban in the existing socialist states suggests that existential threats to a constitutional order are not confined to identity-altering constitutional change. Thus, the toolkit for constitutional self-defense contains more than the doctrine of unconstitutional constitutional amendment, as shown in comparative constitutional studies, the dissolution of anti-constitutionalist parties, the exclusion of individuals with criminal records for treason, sedition or similar antagonistic activities from public office. The ban on organizations considered a danger to democratic constitutionalism, and other measures falling under the notion of militant democracy, are all instruments for constitutional self-defense, 48 yet. In contrast to the party ban in socialist states, as noted above, the legitimacy of measures of constitutional self-defense steered by the concept of militant democracy continues to be contested, 49, 
I hasten to add that the party ban in the existing socialist states is no less contentious than the means associated with militant democracy. Yet what sets them apart is that the party ban in those socialist constitutions is not contested because it is contradictory to the ethos of its attendant constitutional order. On the contrary, constitutional self-defense by means of banning independent parties mirrors a particular type of socialist constitutional identity that the Marxist. Leninist party at the vanguard of the socialist revolution is the core of the constitutional order. 50. To put it bluntly, what is contentious about the party ban in the existing socialist state is not so much about the party ban itself in socialist constitutional terms as about the very morality and legitimacy of those socialist constitutional orders. 51. In contrast, as a variety of constitutional self-defense, Militant democracy has raised concerns over its compatibility with the very constitutional order that it is intended to defend, that is, constitutional democracy. 52. This should come as no surprise. After all, the very core of militant democracy is to banish the forces that aim to alter the constitutional regime from the competitive political processes that would enable them to replace constitutional democracy with another type of political order by democratic means. 53. It should be noted that the competitiveness of such political processes assumes the inclusive character of constitutional democracy. 54. If the democratic process is selectively inclusive of some political forces but not of others, its competitive character is constrained. 55. As Hannah Arendt observed when revolutionary zeal was still burning in the world, democracy as a constitutional order of political freedom works on the basis of deliberate choice and considered opinion in the face of competing political forces, that is, it is based on free consent, not collective will. 56. When some competitors are excluded from a political process, it raises the question whether the democratic choice of government resulting from the constrained political competition still gives expression to free consent. By rejecting accommodating anti-democratic forces in free political competition, democracy turns militant. Here, one finds militant democracy, insofar as it deviates from the democratic idea of inclusiveness. 57. It casts doubt on the ethos of constitutional democracy as a political order of freedom. 58. In contrast, in constitutional orders such as China, Cuba, Vietnam and other socialist states where intolerant, exclusionist rule displaces political competition. 59. The idea of democracy, whether militant or not, does not enter the equation in planning constitutional self-defense. In such constitutional regimes where the constitutional ethos is undemocratic, 60. Speaking of militant democracy in the discussion of constitutional self-preservation just makes no sense. The foregoing discussion illuminates why bringing up militant democracy in the debate surrounding constitutional self-defense makes constitutional scholars sweat. 61. Militant democracy causes anxiety in this grand constitutional debate to the extent that it brings the question of constitutional ethos to the fore. To put it differently, in a constitutional order that does not assume free and equal competition in the political process at its core, entertaining militant democracy in the constitutional self-defense plan will hardly raise eyebrows. In the existing socialist state, with their constitutional identity built around the exclusionist rule of democratic centralism. Under the leadership of the Vanguard Movement Party, speaking of constitutional self-defense in terms of militant democracy, evokes irony or infelicity, to borrow a term from the theory of Speech Act 62 rather than anxiety. Notably, these socialist states are not alone in the face of infelicity amid the talks of militant democracy and constitutional self-defense. Reaching beyond the usual suspect settings, 63 comparative constitutional scholarship has shown that not all democratic regimes embrace the idea of inclusiveness and free equal competition in political participation. 64 thus, in democratic regimes, including but not limited to Pakistan, Singapore and Thailand, which consider competing political ideas in hierarchical terms according to religious, ideological or state-steered communitarian values. 65. Constitutional self-defense would not engage the constitutional ethos by discriminating against or even banning the political forces entertaining ideas 
that are deemed unworthy of equal respect in constitutional terms, since the ethos of such constitutions is to be found in terms of established religion, official ideology, or even state espoused common good. 66 such non liberal democratic regimes should not feel troubled by the exclusion of some competitors from the political process. Instead, should they choose to keep out the political forces striving to displace the constitutional ethos defined in religious, ideological or communitarian terms by democratic means, these exclusionary policies reflect, rather than contradict, the existing constitutional ethos. Thus, the choices for constitutional self-defense by democratic regimes to which free and equal political competition is alien would not shed much light on our appreciation of the challenges that the idea of militant democracy poses to the grand debate over the defense of constitutional democracy. Only in constitutional orders where different political ideas and beliefs are entitled to compete freely on an equal footing in political processes, does excluding or banning the political forces deemed to be endangering the constitutional regime from free political competition, a typical means of militant democracy, raise the ethos question in conceiving of constitutional self-defense, 67. This is where the context in which the discourse on militant democracy finds itself is revealed. Democracy is more than a means of channeling political participation as it presupposes normative values of freedom and equality that is, liberal democracy. 68. Militant democracy only raises concerns over the constitutional ethos in the constitutional defense of liberal democracy, and thus becomes contentious. 69. Although needs for constitutional self-preservation are not off limits to non-liberal regimes, whether they are democratic or not, failing to see the presupposed normative democratic character of constitutional ordering in the debate over militant democracy, we risk eliding constitutional self-defense and militant democracy and thus underappreciate the latter's challenge. Moreover, with this underlying normative assumption left out, the absence of an international version of militant democracy amid authoritarian forces marching on the international plane becomes a puzzle. It is to this puzzling absence that I now turn. 3. The authoritarian turn in international law, a betrayal of character, to resolve the puzzle of the absence of the idea of militant democracy in the international legal order. This section first examines the perceived authoritarian turn in international law, how the character of international law representative but not democratic, prevents the internationalization of the idea of militant democracy will be discussed next, a reading international law under authoritarian clouds, while a constitutional democracy is dislodged when authoritarian forces manage to reduce it to a democratic shell emptied of normative substance. The emergence of authoritarian international law does not herald the arrival of an authoritarian international legal order, 70 as Ginsburg observes. The authoritarian penetration into the international legal order only ends the dominance of what he calls pro-democratic or liberal international law. Here and after liberal international law, in the post-Cold War era, without eradicating international law's liberal constituents, 71 emerging from the end of liberal dominance is an international legal order co-inhabited by three species of international law, the liberal and the authoritarian, with the general sitting in between, 72 on this view. These three species exist in a horizontal relationship. Each has its own place in the international legal order. Upon closer inspection, however, the horizon is not as flat as it seems. In contrast to Ginsburg's portrayal above, Marty Koskademi, when observing the recent backlash against international institutions in his 2018 ASA lecture, remarked, I do not think international law has been seriously challenged. 73. He continued to note that the basic principles of international law such as sovereignty, non-intervention, treaty making and immunity remained intact. 74. Noticeably, the basic principles of international law that Koskanimi invoked as evidence to the not, seriously, challenged state of international law fall into Ginsburg's general species of international law, instead of resulting from the authoritarian end of the liberal dominance of the international order, the general species has long existed as the basic principles of international law, notwithstanding the vicissitudes of different ideologies in the international arena, general international law essentially stands prior to, or above, if you will, 
its liberal and authoritarian cohabitants in the international legal order, with the tilted horizon on which Ginsburg's three species of international law stand revealed, we can now better appreciate how authoritarian international law emerges. For a start, as with its liberal opponent, authoritarian international law does not result from the abrupt domination of the international legal order by some hegemon. S. Instead, both the liberal and authoritarian species find their places in international law by legal means, 75 echoing past landmark changes in the international legal order, 76 authoritarian international law materializes through cooperation between inter alia authoritarian states that employ the neural general international legal tools to pursue their common authoritarian goals on new international platforms, 77 for example, taking advantage of their sovereign status in the making of international law, 78 authoritarian states are able to create new multilateral arrangements among themselves, 79 as a result, new institutions of international law such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, have emerged alongside the established ones that are still dominated by liberal values. 80 more importantly, as the SCO example suggests, its focus on the suppression of terrorism, separatism and extremism through measures such as information sharing, extradition and denials of asylum, undercuts the liberal principle of a political offense exception in the law of extradition. Under the SCO regime, political dissidents of individual member states who are charged with terrorism, separatism or extremism for their involvement in non-violent resistant activities are extraditable, even though such crimes fall under the category of political offense. 81. Proceeds for an authoritarian exception to the political offense exception in international law are therefore sowed, staying away from the liberal regimes in the international order, authoritarian states bring authoritarian, or, rather, special international law into existence among themselves. Notably, authoritarian states do not just stay away to promote their common interests. 82 authoritarian states further attempt to push away or dilute liberal values and thus expand influence. On the one hand, authoritarian states create parallel mechanisms in competition with the established ones with an eye to weakening the latter's influence. Consider the China-initiated Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB.83 since its inception in 2016, the AIIB has established itself as a substantial alternative source of international credit for some countries that used to look to the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, ADB, or other lending sources for financing their various projects of economic development. With its strings-free lending policy, the AIIB's influence has grown steadily. Now it is seen as undercutting the efforts of the World Bank and other traditional creditors to push for governance reform in the credit receiving countries through the mechanism of conditionalities. 84 In addition, the AIIB is contesting the ADB's role in Asia amid the rise of new geo-economic and geopolitical challenges. 85 On the other hand, authoritarian states have learned to use the liberal language of human rights and democracy to promote their own causes. 86 Through this concept co-optation and other means of engagement, 87 authoritarian states may eventually influence the established international mechanisms, taking, together, a new species of international law is emerging where authoritarian states are endeavoring to push away international law's liberal constituents. This synopsis of the means to contest liberal dominance of the international legal order suggests that authoritarian international law virtually arises at the expense of its liberal opponent by shifting between the stay away and push away strategies, 88 yet this contrasting image of liberal and authoritarian international law is deceiving, it obscures the general species of international law that continues to stand separately from its liberal and authoritarian cohabitants, as has been alluded to, authoritarian international law is formed through the employment of the same neural general international legal tools that have enabled liberal values to crystallize into international human rights law, the epitome of both international laws, liberating promise in its last utopia.89 seen in this light, the rise of authoritarian international law is more than a result of the authoritarian drive, as states behind liberal international law have failed to live up to aspirations for cosmopolitan ideals and universal rights, 
90 The liberating promises set out in international human rights law becomes hollow, only to elicit backlash that provides fertile ground for anti-liberal forces. 91 When the liberal promise is broken, international law's sovereignty is doctrinal basics, which Kinspo characterizes as general international law, allow for the emergence of the authoritarian species at the expense of its liberal opponent in the international legal order. 92 The Formation of authoritarian international law is thus symptomatic of, inter alia, the gap between international law's sovereignist doctrinal basics and its universal liberating promise for cosmopolitan humanism. Point nine three does this mean that international law's promise for cosmopolitan humanism is equidistant from its liberal and authoritarian species? My answer is no. It is true that not all the motley international human rights that give expression to international law's liberating promise are attributed to the states associated with liberal international law, the not-so liberal new states emerging from decolonization deserve recognition for their role in bringing economic development and other social justice issues into international human rights law, which are now part and parcel of liberal international law, at least on the books 94, although they also have their share of responsibility in breaking the promises of human rights. 95. Even the Soviet Union had once played a role in shaping the liberal legal architecture of international criminal justice, before it engaged its Western ideological rivals in the long Cold War. 96. There is also no denying that liberal international law, especially international human rights law, has been used by its self-designated guardians in cynical ways to advance their anything but liberal goals. 97. Nevertheless, as the motley international human rights treaties exhibit, Liberal international law, with its underlying liberalism that is accommodating of a wide range of conceptions of Justice 98, tends to be more aligned than its authoritarian contestant, with international law's universal liberating promise for cosmopolitan humanism. 99 Thus, as the international legal order is driven further down the authoritarian road, at the expense of the present balance between liberal and authoritarian international law, the worry is that the authoritarian forces on the international plane seem to parallel their domestic counterparts with a mission to transform the existing legal order. Notably, international law had moved in the liberal or pro-democratic direction before authoritarian states gradually rose to end the liberal dominance in the past 20 years. 100. The international legal order coming out of the liberal dominance has worked to the benefit of democracies. 101. Thus, as the authoritarian forces are tilting the existing international legal order further away from cosmopolitan ideals, democracies are also undercut, if not endangered, from the authoritarian forces continuing march on the international plane. Can we infer that the existing international legal order requires defending itself, because its identity is now at stake? Need the international legal order be defended in a way that corresponds to what has been said about militant democracy? B. Representation without international militant democracy. To answer the questions raised above, let us first consider whether international law is defined by democracy, and thus requires a militant conception of democracy for self-defense. Arguments for the democratic character of international law rest chiefly on two bases. In the 1990s when one authoritarian regime after another was washed away by the democratic wave, 102 The right to democracy was seen as emerging from the global march of democracy. 103 Yet it eventually failed to materialize as a globally recognized international norm. 104 Skepticism abounds about the advocacy for the putative right to democracy in international law. 105 For one, the putative right to democracy raises concerns about whether it may result in a new exception to the principle of non-intervention in international law raising the risk of the hegemonic interference in domestic affairs. 106 for another, it is questioned for undercutting the inclusive character of international law. 107 once international law is wedded to democracy, it turns away from aspirations for universality and ceases functioning as a common language. Without it, the states are denied the medium in which they can negotiate mutual accommodation for their conflicting interests. 108 thus, even if calls for democracy and international law have researched recently. 109. The attempt to align the international legal order with democracy remains as contested as it was in the 1990s when the right to democracy was first floated.
110, the second line of argument for the democratic character of international law, essentially speaks to the question of identity. It is argued that, as the legal framework governing interstate relations, international law is democratic in that all states are supposedly included in its making. 111 is reflected in the three primary sources of international law. 112 states participate in international lawmaking by becoming contracting parties to treaties with their individual state practices and the attendant opinio juris in the development of customary international law, or through their domestic legislation or case law in the formation of the general principles of law. 113, while treaties are only binding on the contracting parties. 114 International law seemingly results from the participation of all states in terms of the making of customary international law and the general principles of law. 115 This volitional, universal, character remains indispensable to a democratic rendering of the international legal order. 116 The problem with this democratic characterization of international law is its conflation of democracy and representation. Although modern democracy is mostly representative, representative democracy is not the only institutional manifestation of democracy. 117 Moreover, representation is distinct from democracy, conceptually and institutionally. As Hannah Pitkin's classic work points out, representation can be considered in terms of standing for or acting for point 118 in the former strand. Even a demagogic leader can be seen as representative as a democratically elected legislature. 119 Moreover, as the history of parliamentary institutions shows, 120 an unelected multi-member legislative chamber is far from a democratic parliament as we know it, but it is nonetheless representative in terms of its law-making function. 121 against this conceptual and institutional backdrop, the process of international law. Making is apparently representative since no state is supposed to be left out. 122 still, it does not quite tell us whether international lawmaking is democratic. Strictly speaking, international law remains centered on interstate relations. 123 despite the increasing role of individuals in some international matters, such as minority protection, armed conflict and foreign investment. 124 in contrast to states. They are far from subjects in international lawmaking, given the discrepancies in interest between the world community and individual states, the complex relationship between the national community and individuals, and the gap between a government and its citizens. The volitional participation of states in international lawmaking cannot be considered democratic in a meaningful way as far as individuals are concerned. 125 moreover. With international law reaching a wide range of matters traditionally considered domestic concerns, from civil rights, to environmental protection, to corruption individuals' lack of direct access, to international lawmaking poses an acute challenge of democracy to the international legal order. 126 worse, notwithstanding international lawmaking's representative character, inequality among states in international decision making still exists in the foundational organizations of the post-World War to international legal order such as the United Nations Security Council and the International Monetary Fund. 127 taken together, international law has long suffered from a double democratic deficit, having distinguished the respective pertinence of representation and democracy to international lawmaking. We can now affirm that international lawmaking itself is representative of the diverse views held by individual states. 128 yet, from representative international lawmaking, it would be a leap of logic to infer that international law is democratic in character, with the non-democratic character of international law revealed. It is no wonder that the concept of militant democracy is absent from the debate stirred by the emergence of authoritarian international law alongside the established international legal regimes, apart from the question of the absent international militant democracy. However, it remains to be addressed whether there exists something at the core of the international legal order that requires defending in a way that is akin to constitutional self-defense. The discussion of international lawmaking has indicated that the international legal order rests on the participation of states. All states are supposedly represented in the formation of international law, regardless of their constitutional regimes.
the representative character of international lawmaking speaks to the value of pluralism in the international legal order. 129 is pluralism the identity of international law. Let us start by comparing the state of international law and its domestic parallel. As has been noted, in the domestic context, the identity to be preserved under the idea of constitutional self-defense is substantive. Much of what constitutes the substance of the constitutional identity of constitutional democracy can also be found in international law. 130, for example, fundamental rights, social rights, and the basic principles of the rule of law have all found their way into various international legal instruments, including the various international human rights treaties. 131, yet it is one thing to say that international law admits human rights, the rule of law or democracy. It is quite another to say that such values constitute the identity of the international legal order. 132 instead, as suggested above, such substantive values are associated with liberal international law, which has taken shape within the framework governed by general international law. Taking this into account, if there is such a thing as identity that justifies international law's self-defense, it must be part of general international law instead of liberal or authoritarian international law. Among the basic principles of international law that constitute general international law, referred to in section 3, is sovereignty. 133 apart from its jurisprudential role in giving formal identity and systematic character to international law. 134 sovereignty takes on normative significance under the principle of sovereign equality. 135 despite ambiguities surrounding the meaning of pluralism in the international legal order. 136 the principle of sovereign equality gives shape to pluralism in international law. 137 if so, to defend pluralism as the identity of international law amounts to upholding the decentralized and horizontal international legal order of which state sovereignty is the linchpin. 138, to frame pluralism here as some substantive value that gives purpose to international law and justifies defending it in the way that is akin to constitutional self-defense makes little sense. A more promising way to render pluralism in international law substantive and, thus, suitable for self-defense is to draw on its value as an ethical doctrine. 139 in this way, some resonance can be found between pluralism and liberalism. 140 even so, pluralism in international law is no parallel to liberalism in constitutional law that requires constitutional self-defense, as discussed in section 2. Liberalism comprises substantive values that may require constitutional self-defense by means of militant democracy. Instead of lending itself to international anarchy, pluralism in international law is moderated and tied to the commitment to one global legal order. 141 here. We see the two faces of international law, pluralism and universalism. Through the latter, the pluralist international legal order is brought closer to some common ethos of liberalism. 142. The problem is that what substantiates the one pluralism, rooted global legal order still comes from units of ethical pluralism, that is, states, 143 is an ethical doctrine, pluralism in international law remains anything but a substantive identity suitable, for being defended in a way that is akin to constitutional self-defense, seen in this light, the emergence of authoritarian international law, barely indicates that the international legal order is taking an authoritarian turn. Rather, it gives expression to the strong pluralism embedded in international law after the liberal dominance came to an end. 144. The absence of calls for militant democracy on the international plane amid the global authoritarian wave reflects the uniqueness of the authoritarian challenge beyond the domestic constitutional landscape. The coexistence of distinct normative species resulting from the emergence of authoritarian international law, at the end of the liberal dominance, essentially gives away the open, pluralist character of the international legal order, 145 instead of a substantive identity that justifies internationalization of constitutional self-defense, pluralism in international law, reveals the limits in drawing an analogy between the constitutional and international legal order with the limitation of constitutional analogy brought to light. The problem with current advocacy for democracy vis a vis the growing authoritarian influence on the international plane will soon come to the fore. For what if militant democracy goes international?
keeping the promise alive between militant democracies and the duarchy. As discussed above, the concept of militant democracy that has made constitutional scholars sweat in conceiving of constitutional self-defense is virtually absent on the international plane due to the non-democratic international legal order, yet the non-democratic character of international law does not suggest that democracy is missing in the international legal order. 146 just as in the constitutional universe where militant democracy has pervaded constitutional democracies in practice, despite the anxiety over its tension with the ethos of liberal democracy. 147, the defense of democracy has been taken to the international arena, although without adopting the label of militant democracy. 148, where such democracy advocacy will let us can be better appreciated by looking back at the road we have traveled, drawing on the empirical evidence. Ginsburg notes that international law had moved in the pro-democratic, liberal direction before the rise of authoritarian influence in the international arena. 149, it was the time when liberal democracies effectively steered the direction of the international legal order and challenged, suggesting that the dominant values of the international legal order reflected those held by the steering states in the development of international law. This is no surprise since the state still holds the key to international lawmaking, despite the perceived decline of the Westphalian system. 150, it follows that a state's character as reflected in its constitutional regime exerts substantial influence on its participation in the international legal order, considering the outsized influence of the leading states, or, rather, hegemons, on the workings of the international system. It is fair to say that, when the leading states' character changes or when the old leadership gives way to new hegemons, international law finds itself in new circumstances and changes. 151 thus. The emergence of authoritarian international law is not so much the change of the identity of the international legal order as the result of the replacement of one hegemon with another, with the liberating promises embodied in international human rights law broken. The legitimacy of liberal dominance and its hegemons is gradually undermined, driving the insurgency against liberal internationalism closer to nationalism. 152 capitalizing on its newfound economic and political prowess, China as the longtime champion of nationalism and anti-colonialism in the international arena fills the void amid criticisms of Western liberal hypocrisy. 153 is a new great power. China is in a position to reshape international law with the strategy of norm entrepreneurship. 154. While China emerges as a new hegemon and authoritarian nationalism is on the rise in various democracies, the international legal order is tilted away from universalism which is reminiscent of the common ethos of liberalism. 155. No wonder the challenge posed by the emergence of authoritarian international law to the international legal order and the considered response are viewed through the lens of China-US relations. 156. Seen in this light, the defense of democracy verges on reasserting liberal values, if not the USAS leading role in the world order. 157. And it becomes problematic. I hasten to add that the open, pluralist character of the international legal order, as identified above, does not mean that liberal democracies should only engage in the development of international law, as if it is business as usual. They are as legitimate as their authoritarian counterparts to shape the international legal order in line with their common goals. 158. On the other hand, pluralism or openness in the international legal order does not suggest that liberal democracies are free to do whatever it takes to mold international law according to their shared values. 159 yet, as like, mindedness and the like increasingly become the code words for the US-led self-identified democracies to push back the global authoritarian wave. 160. What is emerging seems to be a replay of the Holy Alliance of the 19th century only this time to defend liberal democracies, or, rather, the interests of liberal democracies 161 instead of dynastic legitimacy. 162. Speaking of the Community for Democracies idea, and the nascent projects organized around the biannual Summit of Democracies, convened by the USA, 163 Ginsburg rightly questions the plausibility of such democratic alliances in terms of the diversity among democracies, 164, 
It should be noted that the challenges posed by such democratic alliances to international law go beyond issues of practicality, as pointed out by Ginsburg, even if the so-called like-minded democracies could set aside their differences and get united around the common cause of resisting the authoritarian march, their inter-democracy alliance would further deepen the current division in the international legal order. International law would only see another fragmentation as a result of the division between authoritarian and liberal forces. 165 going down that road, the international legal order would find itself surrounded by militant democracies, among others. Moving beyond the constitutional orders, the idea of militant democracy seems to lend an inadvertent hand to the like-minded democracies on the conceptual front in their competition with the perceived authoritarian coalition, only to mold the international legal order into a hearkening authoritarian versus like-minded democratic division. 166 This is a great disservice to international law. 167 Then what is the road ahead? Ginsburg's prognosis of the emergence of authoritarian international law alongside other species of international law answers the question with assorted policy proposals. His preferred response to the increasing authoritarian influence on international law comprises components of preservative support for civilian liberal movements and pro-democratic regional organizations. 168 engagement with authoritarian states through cooperation in areas of common concerns. 169 indirect Containment of authoritarian forces through existing legal regimes 170 and multilateralism, 171 obviously. These suggestions do not exhaust the options for liberal democracies. Nevertheless, they give away the underlying thinking behind the proposals that are focused on the authoritarian challenge facing the international legal order. Without risking an unholy alliance of militant democracies vis a grave, vis the authoritarian forces. Specifically, some of Ginsburg's proposals, preservative support and multilateralism, are aimed at fortifying democratic forces, 172 others, engagement and indirect containment, are meant to de escalate the tension between liberal and authoritarian forces, 173 taken together, seeking coexistence or, rather, maintaining the balance between liberal and authoritarian forces in the international arena underpins this third way. The question is whether international law will be less fragmented in that managed balanced world. A closer inspection of this third way suggests that it will not be engagement through cooperation in areas of common concerns and indirect containment through existing legal regimes are only able to reclaim some islands that would allow the liberal and authoritarian states to coexist in the tumultuous ocean of the fragmented international legal order, preservative democracy support for regional organizations and sticking to multilateralism in dealings with fellow liberal democracies also form short of bringing the world together. Rather, their focus is on democratic solidarity. Ultimately, the third way is a function of the China-US relationship that underpins the new international order, 174 coexisting with a sinner-centric East failure. The West Falian system evolves as a duarchy, whose sustainability depends on the balance of power between two co-ruling hegemons, China and the USA. 175 is this as good as we can get amidst the emergence of authoritarian international law? Can international law help itself out? Centering on policies, Ginsburg's third way seems to suggest that international law falls silent on its own current condition. Policy choices appear to hold the key to its future, as international law is always entangled with politics. Yet what kind of policy choices can bring international law closer to its promise for cosmopolitan humanism is not just a matter of political decision. As Ginsburg acknowledges, authoritarian international law is identified in the normative development that specifically enhances authoritarianism. 176. It is the normative side of the international order that is international law that informs my answer yes international law can help itself as discussed in section 3 international organizations ios and other less formal intergovernmental mechanisms are instrumental to the development of authoritarian norms 177 yet this is no evidence of the chinese authoritarian exceptionalism among historical attempts to reshape the international legal order 178 rather it illustrates the importance of the institutional dimension of international law.
Ginsburg's third way sheds light on how liberal democracies can better influence institutions in the face of authoritarian international law through policies, apart from policies on strategic maneuvering, multilateralism and, more importantly, universalism inherent in IOs and other international institutions set out the norms of institutional engagement by all states, 179 through this lens. The USAS lack of engagement with, or complete withdrawal from, multilateral fora is not only a strategic blunder that contributes to the current normative development of international law. 180 choosing unilateralism over multilateralism 181 is also a betrayal of universalism and international law itself. 182 seen, in this light, re-engagement in the established universal IOs deserves more attention not only for policy reasons, it is also demanded by the normative imperative to keep international law's universal liberating promise alive. The normative imperative to keep international law's universal liberating promise takes us beyond institutions. As suggested in Section 3, authoritarian international law arises when international law's universal promise for cosmopolitan humanism is broken, abused in cynical ways, democracy, Human rights and other progressive causes recognized in international law barely offer the hope for emancipation. These liberal values are indeed what international law has promised to those who have yearned for liberation. 183 and this remains unchanged, despite the emergence of authoritarian international law. Yet international law cannot keep its universal liberating promise, just by providing more promises, or making the wish list longer, to keep the hope for emancipation alive international law must find a way to deliver its promise. The question is that, in the Westphalian world that is still wearing the state veil, 184, there seems to be only so much that international law can do in its own right to turn its promise for cosmopolitan humanism into reality, 185. Notably, the universal liberating promise for cosmopolitan humanism transcends international law itself. It is also at the core of the constitutional project of freedom and progress, 186 through this lens, the law of cosmopolitan humanism is situated in a pluralist normative universe, that is, a nomus 187 wherein both international law and domestic constitutional orders find themselves. 188 in this larger normative universe, international law's universal liberating promise of cosmopolitan humanism may see itself come to fruition beyond the limits of the traditional territory of international law as manifested in the constitutional landscape from the global south and beyond. Social and economic rights are not mere programmatic guidelines, 189 carried out innovatively, they can make real-world structural impact, 190 including rebuilding the relationship between the government and the people on trust, 191 partnering with domestic constitutional orders, International law may find a way to continue to contribute to emancipation in the face of the authoritarian push against its liberal constituents. International law can help itself by conceiving of the normative imperative of universalism, as embodied in international institutions, that are indispensable to its functioning, transcending the current limits of constitutional analogy, as has been revealed in the discussion of the internationalization of militant democracy, International law may find a nomus of universalism through an alignment with constitutional orders, embedded in this universal but pluralist nomus. A new constitutional analogy offers hope for making good on international law's promise for cosmopolitan humanism in a rooted form. 192. 5. Conclusion. International law has long been seen in a progressive light, moving towards the achievement of the common goals of humanity, 193 among the goals guiding the progression of international law is the rule of law, which has even been framed in constitutional terms again in the golden era of international law, following the end of the Cold War. 194 yet, as a new Cold War is looming, international law is seen to be veering off the course of the rule of law, suggesting the emergence of authoritarian international law that dashes the assumed teleological, progressive outlook in international legal reasoning, 195 in contrast to recent efforts to reframe and reform international law through constitutional analogy, the concept of militant democracy that has resurged as the focal point in planning, constitutional self-defense has been missing in the discussion of how international law can avert going down the authoritarian road.
this discrepancy between constitutional orders and international law made this global authoritarian wave guides, what I have argued in this article, to make sense of the puzzling absence of the concept of militant democracy on the international plane, I have first taken up the relationship between constitutional self-defense and militant democracy. It turns out that not all appeals for constitutional self-defense raise the question of constitutional ethos in the same way that the call for militant democracy does. Drawing on this analytical point, I have further argued that the concept of militant democracy presupposes a democratic and normative version of constitutional ordering, compared to the prevalence of the concept of militant democracy in the discussion of the self-preservation of constitutional democracies. Its absence on the international plane reveals the non-democratic character of the international legal order. Moreover, it speaks to the lack of substantive identity and in international law that will justify defending in a way that is akin to constitutional self-defense. This is where the current constitutional analogy in conceiving of the international legal order reaches its limits. Despite its apparent absence on the international plane, the concept of militant democracy is susceptible to internationalization as the emerging authoritarian versus like-minded democratic division hardens. Concerned by the unsettling effect on the international legal order of calls for an alliance of militant democracies, I take up the want of internationalization of militant democracy ahead of time in this critique. Through critical engagement with the imaginary constitutional analogy in international law, an international version of militant democracy, I have shown the current limits of this international constitutional analogy. Yet, from there, a promising constitutional analogy emerges that may give fresh impetus for the universalism of international law. International law is neither liberal nor authoritarian, while both liberal and authoritarian constituents find themselves in the international legal order, a testament to the universalism of international law. This is why international law is aligned with cosmopolitan humanism and universal rights. Yet this universal liberating promise becomes the source of frustration if it is just a hollow hope with no prospect of being turned into reality. Transcending its current limits, international law can see its affinity with domestic constitutional orders in the quest for cosmopolitan humanism through a project of universal progress. With this realignment of international law and the constitutional project of progress, we may only be inching towards the emancipatory goal, but nonetheless progressing in a rooted and hopeful way. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press on behalf of EJIL Limited. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse distribution and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited ming sung kyo militant democracy unmoored the limits of constitutional analogy in international law european journal of international law volume 35 issue 2 may 2024, pages 411 to 440. HTTPS colon slash slash doi dot org slash one zero dot one zero nine three slash schedule slash chai zero two three.